Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my epic rant on the 2023 action sequel, an epic dumpster fire that is The Expendables 4. Or if you look at the poster, Expend Forbles. I, I still can't believe they went with that, especially after how uh, well received a uh, fan four stick was. Now. It's fitting that this bad sequel has a bad title. This is one of those franchises that should have stopped years ago. Honestly, I think it should have stopped after two because it was already starting to show that they were getting the wrong idea when it comes to what was appealing about this franchise in the first place. And they were going into more of the direction of parody than a heartfelt tribute to the old school action films of uh, yesteryear. But I guess you could make an argument though. Maybe with a third film, they could maybe learn from the mistakes of the second movie, but instead they decided to try to appeal to an audience that didn't give two shits about these old school action heroes or these old school uh, style action films and made it PG 13 and it bombed. And that should have been the the death knell for this franchise, considering how poorly that film did. But I guess it made enough of a profit when it comes to worldwide box office that they wound up deciding to do another one. And uh, it turned out to be the worst one yet. This is a franchise that with each sequel has gotten progressively worse. So this being as bad as it is isn't as frustrating as other franchises failures for me. This is one of those things where I'm, I'm, I'm just more disappointed, you know, because it's got this track record of just not doing the right thing and not following the paths that are provided to it when it comes to redeeming itself. So because it just continually fucks up, you're just like, you know, I'm not even mad anymore. I'm just disappointed. That's how I feel about this franchise. <laughs> now, it's uh, directed by Scott Waugh, who prior to this, he uh, directed uh, Need for Speed, as well as such winners like Act of Valor and Six Below with Josh Hartnett, a film that probably only six people have ever seen. And, uh, and a film called Hidden Strike with uh, John Cena and Jackie Chan. And his direction is pretty bad. Like, there's a lot of shots in this where you can just tell that they were shooting behind a green screen. And the direction doesn't do anything to really hide that fact. So it takes you out of the film on more than one occasion. There are sequences involving big, elaborate action scenes with high body counts and lots of gunplay and explosions and and uh, martial arts and all of that. But the way that, the, that it's shot is just so generic. It doesn't really have any signature style or flair to it. it. The direction by Scott looks like any other bit of direction you would get from just a random list of uh, directors that you pulled out of a hat. Like there's nothing that special about what he brought to this. And I think at this point in this franchise, they needed somebody who could bring in some fresh new style or flair to uh, the franchise or to this particular film, because that's really the only thing that was really going to, in my opinion, do the most when it comes to making this a, a, at least better than its predecessor. But that's not something that really happened with this one. And for every competent shot or tracking shot or scene that involves uh, some fight choreography or an, another action set piece, there's another one that is uh, pretty incompetent and pretty poorly done. So I'm not going to sit here and say that it's like the worst direction but it's definitely a direction that is very firmly below average and it could have been better. 
in a multitude of different ways. Uh, a lot of the shots are, are honestly to the point where it looks like it's one of those direct to streaming movies and not actually a film that cost a hundred million dollars and was released for theaters. It's been in direct to streaming uh, action doesn't have to be shot poorly. Look no further than the direction of someone like Isaac Florentine, who directed a bunch of, uh, of films that uh, featured Scott Atkins. Uh, I think Isaac Florentine would have done a fantastic job and would have been a really nice addition to this franchise. And I would love to have seen what he could have done with an Expendables movie. But instead, you hired a guy who did the need for speed. Which is honestly more known for just being a lazy ripoff of Fast and the Furious than literally anything else. Which is also kind of fitting because this franchise is starting to feel like a Fast and the Furious sequel. And not the good ones. The most recent ones that are just stupid and dumb. And speed of stupid and dumb... That's where we get to the script by Kurt Wimmer, Ted Daggerhart, and Max Adams. First off, Ted Daggerhart? That's got to be a made-up name. That's got to be a pseudonym, because that doesn't sound like a real name at all. Uh, but if it's a real name or not, it doesn't really matter, because the guy did a terrible job with the script. This is a movie that started out as... A completely different project. Initially, it was going to be a expendable spinoff called A Christmas Story, where it centered around Lee Christmas, Jason Statham's character, and he was going to have his own film. And I'm glad that didn't happen because that title is beyond dumb, and we don't need an expendable spinoff. I like Jason Statham, but we don't need a Lee Christmas movie. There was also plans to maybe do a all-female Expendables team spinoff called the Expendables, but thankfully they axed that concept because that was really idiotic and asinine and was an idea that nobody was asking for, including the few female uh, uh, members uh, of, the, of the audience that enjoys these movies. Uh, and then you had this completely different script that wasn't even intended to be an Expendables movie called High Value Target and it got greenlit by Millennium Films and Lionsgate and it was going to be a Jason Statham film but then they decided not to do it and then retooled it into Expendables 4. And I'm like why didn't you just do High Value Target with Jason Statham and have like uh, uh, Uwaz, you know, the, the, the guy, Eko, uh, Uwaz, have him be the, the villain in that. That would have been better than whatever the hell this was. Cause you could definitely tell that this was a different script that they decided to throw expendables characters and expendables elements into. And this script is just so full of just dumb lines and just predictable cliches and not in a way that's like fun. It's just another script that involves another group of terrorists who steal some nuclear detonators and create a nuclear bomb. And it's up for the heroes to stop him. Like how many goddamn times do we have to do that particular storyline before it becomes old? Like really? And Speaking of old, there are so many lines of dialogue between characters, especially the older Expendables members, that comment about how old they are and how much they are losers and how much uh, that uh, they aren't really able to do what they used to do anymore. Like, ha ha ha, Dolph Lundgren, his character Gunner, he, he's old and he can't see. <laughs> it's so funny. And it just comes across as unnecessarily divisive and just annoying. Like I don't understand why this is a, re a reoccurring a trend or theme in these Expendable sequels. Poking fun at the age of these old uh, legendary action icons. Because that's honestly making fun of the audience for these movies. It's It's... 
it's not really a, a major selling factor. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Yeah, you got you got lines where you got Galgo's son, which, by the way, that was just a stupid idea anyway. Who the hell asked for the son of Motormouth from Expendables 3? Not a single soul asked for that shit. So you have Galgo's son, who his whole shtick is that he talks even more and is even more irritating than his dad was. And there's this whole thing where he's talking about getting a golden shower because he likes to get pissed on. I'm like, yeah, and I want to piss on this movie. And there's this whole thing about Barney and he lost his ring to this uh, uh, guy at this bar called the Tainted Spoke, which is fitting because uh, this film can lick my taint and my spoke all at the same goddamn time. And what happens is uh, Jason Statham's character and Stallone's character, they get in a really lame bar fight and they get his ring back that he lost in a thumb wrestling match that was put on a two uh, tier dildo for some reason at the bar. I'm like, great. So this is what you think the franchise is. It's just a pathetic joke. I mean, it is, but you didn't have to make it that obvious and put Barney's ring on a two tier dildo that, and that honestly might as well have been two middle fingers. And what's funny is there is a middle finger in this movie. What is supposed to be the corpse of Barney Ross, because later on in a mission that goes wrong, Barney supposedly dies in a plane crash. And so what they do is they have his, his, uh, his finger flipping the bird at the memorial for uh, his memory, you know, and for his death. And I'm like, that's, that's literally how most fans feel about this franchise at this point. They're just like, fuck this man, fuck this shit. So yeah, there's this shit that happens at Libya and Barney supposedly dies and that causes Lee Christmas to get kicked out of the Expendables because he went against orders to try to save Barney. And that just doesn't make any sense to me why they would kick him out of the team because in all honesty, he's the only one that was really doing anything. He was doing the majority of the work. The mission wouldn't have been halfway as successful without him. Because you got Gunner who can't see, let alone shoot straight. You got uh, um, 50 Cent's character, Easy Day, who does nothing except mumble and do some uh, shitty uh, uh, moves where he just like picks up a guy and throws him a couple times and fires a gun. He's every bit as useful as any of the other young Expendables from the previous film. And speaking of that, they make no reference whatsoever to that other team. They don't even say that they were dead. They're just not in the picture anymore. As if this script just completely ignores Expendables 3 like it never happened. Even the whole stuff with the Ocelot, who's supposed to, supposed to be this villain that's hidden in the shadows that Barney's been trying to catch after all this time. They did that shit with Stonebanks in the third movie, and it was done better in that film when it comes to the writing for that character. But anyway, the stuff that had goes down in Libya with the just D team of the Expendables, because now you got this, you got 50 cents character. You've got uh, Megan Fox for for whatever reason is now an expendable you got um of course toll road uh no terry cruz because terry cruz didn't want to drop the lawsuit for being sexually harassed and that's why he wasn't able to be in this movie that's another thing that makes me kind of sour on this franchise is the fact that 
the only reason why Terry Crews wasn't brought back when it comes to his character is because he refused to drop a lawsuit involving sexual assault. Like, what a scummy thing to do, Lionsgate. And you've got uh, Galen, who's the, the son of Galgo. I guess Banderas was supposed to reprise his role, but then he decided to decline. And then that led to him being replaced by his son. That we didn't know anything about in the previous movie. He just now is the son. So that's your team. That's your team of Expendables. And you take Jason Statham's character, Lee Christmas, out of that, you it, it's it's a fail waiting to happen. You throw that team out there in combat and they're going to get their asses handed to them. And that's basically what happens. They get caught in like 30 seconds when they do decide to go on the mission to try to get uh, the guy who killed Barney. Who is this guy named Sawarto, who's a mercenary who works for Ocelot. And they also have this new leader of the Expendables uh, named Marsh, who's a CIA, CIA officer who hires the Expendables, similar to Church, you know, Bruce Willis's character. I read something that they were considering bringing back Bruce Willis, but they couldn't understandably because of Bruce Willis's health. I don't think him being that character really would have made any difference. And honestly, it would have pissed me off more if he turned out to be the ocelot because it would have been like, oh, great. Now, now, now he's the bad guy. So now you take a character that I like from this series and you make him a villain because you're just being lazy. Oh, and oh, oh I forgot about the other new member of the Expendables, Lash, for good reason, because all she is is Alice with chains. That's it. That's all that's all this girl is. She has chains. And she's Asian. And for whatever reason, she falls in love with Toll Road. So there's also this other guy that's involved who was friends with Barney, who decides to join uh uh Lee on this uh mission of revenge named Decha, who I guess was a former Expendable. Another one that just, they just pull out of their ass when it comes to the writers. Like I said, why can't you just have the high-value target movie with Jason Statham playing a different character, no Megan Fox, and just have him work with Tony Jaw, and they go up against eco wise Like, I think that would have been... A much wiser decision than whatever the fuck this was in terms of a screenplay. So yeah, there's a good chunk of the movie where Jason Statham's character, Lee Christmas, he's no longer part of the Expendables, even though that makes no fucking sense. And he gets a job as a security guy for an influencer in a really cringe-inducing scene where you have this fat fuck who is like a social media influencer and he's like super popular and has all these girl hot girls and everything. And I'm like, what reality is this based on? Since when is there a social media influencer who is like 50 to 70 pounds overweight and he's like getting all these hot chicks and shit? Like when it, who is that? Who is that based on? Because it doesn't seem to be based on anyone that I'm familiar with when it comes to social media. I guess maybe he's just some rich guy who's able to buy friends and buy women. Okay, all right. But that's not really established. It just seems like it just set up that the guy is a really popular social media influencer. But the guy isn't funny. He's not attractive. So why the fuck did he, is, does he have such a massive following? Um, But, you know... That's just par for the course when it comes to this brainless screenplay. And if you ask me, that's rather fitting because this screenplay is so brainless and stupid that it has a line of dialogue from Marsh after uh, uh, Iko Uwaz, his character, 
Sorto steals the nuclear detonators from Libya. He has a meeting with the uh, remaining expendables to tell them about their mission and says this line. We have to stop him before he uses those nuclear detonators and turns them into a bomb of the nuclear variety. I'm like, what else is he going to do with the nuclear detonators, you dumbass writer? He's going to use them as earrings? Is he going to use them as Christmas tree ornaments? Like, how stupid can you get? And... A good chunk of this movie just takes place on a aircraft carrier that might as well be shot behind a green screen for the majority of the time because that's at least what it looks like. Prior to that, you had some stuff with Lee Christmas with this unsuccessful moment with the social media influencer where he snaps and beats the crap out of the guy, which I'm like, wouldn't that lead to him getting assault charges and getting arrested and sent to jail? Why does he just get away with it? Because the social media guy is such an asshole, that doesn't really make that doesn't really matter. Like that guy has all this influence and probably has some pretty high powered lawyers. He'd sue his ass and the guy would be sent to jail. <laughs> Whether he's a, a an expendable or not. Well, he's not an expendable anymore, so he doesn't have protection from the government in that regard. So <laughs> but of course, you know, we can't have a movie if if Jason Statham's character gets arrested for uh, the, uh, the rest of uh, this uh, plot. But yeah, he has the failed bout as a security guard. You have the cringe scene with him and, and his girlfriend where they get in a short fight and somehow Gina gets up her hand on him, which makes no sense. And then he goes out on his own to get revenge for Barney Meets up with Tony Jaw. They have a short little fight, but then they decide to work with one another. And a good chunk of the movie is just Jason Statham going around just shooting random guys or knifing them with not really much variety whatsoever. Oh, you have a whole scene too where Toll Road pisses on something and causes a door to open so that uh, the other uh, expendables can get out of the room that they're held captive in. So you have that. You have to see Randy Couture take a piss. There's a lot of piss in this script for some reason. Galgo's son talking about golden showers, toll road peeing. I don't get it. I really don't understand why it's so obsessed with piss, but it is what it is. And you have, like, a bunch of action that happens in the finale. Like, there's a lot of explosions. There's a lot of gunplay. It does a decent job, script-wise, trying to give all these characters some moments to get their shots in. But it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't really provide any real rush or, or adrenaline. And it's not really that creative, either, most of the time, when it comes to the choreography. Or when it comes to what they do, it's just go around, shoot, 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 uh, or occasionally knife somebody or use some martial arts and that's it. It's not anything different than you've probably seen in a million other direct-to-streaming martial arts or action movies at this point. Even the fight between Eco and uh, Jason Statham is, is, is disappointing because it's so short. It, it just seems like it should go on longer and then it's just really short and Jason Statham seems to get the upper hand on this guy way too easily. And then you get the reveal that you saw coming a million miles away that Marsh is actually Ocelot. And you have this whole moment where Lee is trying to sacrifice himself for the good of, of many but then Barney shows up in a helicopter because Barney didn't die. Barney took this guy from the bar from an earlier scene, knocked him out, took him on the plane, replaced him with him, replaced himself with this guy so that when the plane crashed, that's the guy who died and I guess was considered to be Barney. Even though this guy is like considerably shorter than Barney, 
and consider has considerably less muscle mass. Uh, you would think that when that guy died and got burnt up and people looked at that corpse, they would tell like pretty much immediately that that's not Barney. Or they would be able to tell via dental rec records that it's not Barney. But don't ask this script to really use its brain for anything. So that's really not surprising to me that they decided to pull up, pull that dumb shit. Barney shows up with his helicopter, shoots up uh, Ocelot, and they have this whole thing where, oh, I had to die in order to have the documents unsealed so then I could find out who the real Ocelot is. And I'm just like, whatever. And... It's one of those sequels, too, where like it doesn't, doesn't even feel like there's any stakes that are raised. It doesn't feel like there's any fallout to anything that ever happened. Say whatever you want about Expendables 3, but at least they did something where one of the Expendables got wounded and was in the hospital. Here, like, Toll Road gets stabbed but heals from and it is fine. No one dies except all of the bad guys. And anyone that could be considered to be a threat gets defeated way too easily that even the henchman of eco this guy who's established to be like this right hand man of eco's character he gets his ass kicked pretty easily by allison chains and tony jaw and dies laughably because the guy falls into cgi and screams like a total looney tune and as he's falling into cgi land there's just so much about this it's just either goofy or just really poorly done when it comes to the script just the dialogue nothing is funny and so much of the emphasis was on megan fox's character for whatever reason she becomes a de facto leader of the new expendables Gina and I'm like why what the hell has she done to deserve to get this honor should be Toll Road or Gunner why the hell is it Megan Fox's character it doesn't make any sense and all of her dialogue is mostly her just talking in a monotone uh, and giving generic orders to the other Expendables or taking sarcastic shots at Jason Statham's character or just acting like a bitch. That's all that her character gets. And I'm like, why is this character even in this movie, let alone the leader of the team? The only salvageable aspects of the script are stuff involving Jason, Jason Statham and Tony jaw. And they don't save anything because they aren't really given a ton to do. And they just feel like their parts are a part of a completely different movie. And like a, in a film that you would rather see fleshed out than the Expendables movie that's thrown into the mix. Because every time it goes back to the Expendables movie, it's boring. And it's rather uh, uh, irritating a good chunk of the time because of Motormouth, 2.0, Megan Fox... Or five cents. And speaking of Megan Fox and company, then we get to the cast. Jason Statham and Tony Jaw and Iku Uwais are really the only three that are honestly doing any decent work in this. I almost kind of felt bad for them considering what that they were what they were saddled with what they were forced to deal with when it comes to this movie and the dialogue and the scenes that they were subjected with Jason Statham. He definitely honestly uh, comes out the best. He has the best moments in this. He has the only good or decent moments in this other than some stuff with eco or Tony jaw, but his performance is still pretty much, the base level of what you've seen in the other Expendables movies as his character Lee Christmas. But, you know, at least he still has that charm, still has that charisma. Doesn't really seem like he's sleepwalking through the role. So, there's that at least. 
50 cent though five cents worth of acting and charisma megan fox megan fox like all she does is just smolder for the camera with no emotion and no charm no charisma she might as well be a department store mannequin Dolph Lundgren is completely wasted as Goner. They even have this whole thing where they establish that he's been sober for a while, but then they turn that into a joke by making it one of the reasons why he sucks in combat. Because he's sober and he's not drinking anymore. He's not an alcoholic. I'm like, what a great message to send to your audience. Hey, if you're sober, you're a loser. And if you were uh, involved in combat and you're like a, a, a military guy or a special forces guy and you got over your addiction to alcohol, you're going to suck in combat. And, and the only way for you to get better is if you start drinking again. Oh, also with Gunner, he can't see. Because he's old. Like They really did his character so dirty throughout every sequel in this series. After how great he was in the first movie. Tony Jaw, he's fine when it comes to the action. But he's given like maybe five lines and maybe like five scenes total. Eco Awaz, he tries to be an intimidating antagonist. But then he doesn't even turn out to be the main antagonist. And he gets defeated way too easily by uh, Jason Statham. So he, he's honestly pretty toothless by the end of the movie. Uh, and honestly kind of lame when it comes to an antagonist. Randy Couture just as uh, devoid of charisma as always. I like Randy as a UFC talent, but I've never felt that he was that good of a talent as an actor. And so much of his lines is just him once again overdoing the shtick about his ear and that shit was old in the other movies, and it was ancient by the time he kept doing it in this one. You had Jacob's uh, Scipio as Galen, Galgo's son. A good casting. He definitely looks like he's related to Antonio Banderas, and I, he did a good job being an annoying motor mouth. But I can't really say that it's a performance that I really liked. Levy Tran as Lash, the new ex member of the Expendables. Alice with chains. <laughs> like, there's not a whole lot to say about her. She honestly looked like one of those uh, uh, characters that was in one of those Escape Plan sequels that they only cast in the movie so they could get the Asian market in terms of the box office. That's really the kind of vibe that I got from, from this casting choice. Because it definitely wasn't anything involving acting talent. Andy Garcia, this is honestly one of his worst performances. He definitely did this just for a paycheck as Marsh. Overacting, hamming it up, especially at the end of, of this movie. Uh, just just a pretty uh, pathetic performance by Andy Garcia. And he's, a, he's a, honestly a legitimately good actor, but he's just slumming it here. And then Sylvester Stallone, like he's in it for a little bit in the beginning, and then a little bit at the end, and that's about it. And you know what's sad is this this could very well wind up being the last theatrical film that Stallone was ever in. Is this sad sack of a sequel. In a lot of ways, is every bit as uh, bad as some of the Escape Plan sequels, or some of the other directed streaming films that he did, like Backtrace, or some of the other... Uh, piss poor or, or below average movies he's done lately like grudge match or bullet to the head and yeah i can't really say a whole lot about his performance because it's barely that much of a performance he's in it for like two minutes maybe three throughout the entire movie and a lot of it is him just showing up saying a few lines trying to bust Jason Statham's balls, talk about how his back hurts and he can't fight in the bar, but then he's able to throw a guy over the bar and then he's like, oh, my back's fine now. Repeating the whole line from the first movie, you're welcome. Uh, and at this point, it's not welcome anymore because it's just tiresome. 
Just like this entire fucking franchise is just tiresome at this point. And it's got tired cinematography by Tim Maurice Jones. The editing by Michael J. Duthie is, is absolute dookie at times. Just straight up dookie level editing, especially when it comes to some of the action scenes. Now, the film's score, it's less than spectacular by Guillaume uh, Roussel. He replaced Tyler Bates, I think, who did the, the scores for the previous three. Because Tyler Bates couldn't do the score for this one because he was too busy with other movies. And like I said, it's less than spectacular. It just is more of the same when it comes to the kind of music that you've heard in the other Expendables movies. But without the benefit of some good original tracks, you know, like Boom Lay Boom. Like or even some of the classic rock songs that they used in this in the first film. You get the boys are back in town at the end credits. You get a couple of other attempts at, at some classic rock songs, but it doesn't really come together or work that well. And you get some other songs, like some rap songs or some hip hop stuff at some point that sounds pretty shitty. So the score, not the best, but I definitely feel the worst offender is the songs that they use for the soundtrack. Because a lot of them were straight up ear poison to listen to. I made an already hard film to watch because of just how boring and bad it was, even more insufferable. And the production values on this are abysmal. This movie cost $100 million. It doesn't look like any of that is on the screen because there's so many scenes in this where they are clearly doing shit behind the most obvious green screen imaginable. Like it was really obvious watching it at home and I can't even imagine how obvious it would have been watching it on the big screen. Just a lot of really shitty CGI. It's rated R, but it doesn't really make it a good movie. This film is a prime example of an R rating and some uh, CGI blood doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good because the story matters. The script matters. Like you have all of that stuff, but it doesn't fucking matter if all the other elements, the important vital elements of the film aren't properly handled or aren't well done. So yeah, all Expendables 4 does is it gives fans the raw deal and a raw asshole. So <laughs> th that's, uh, that's my thoughts on Expendables 4. And until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.